today we are honored to have a guest speaker mr harsh doshi he is a founder and founder of hub beverages and a representative of indian association of functional medicine he has spent 5 plus years creating solution for a good health using traditional and fermented indian foods his beverages called bitters and mango leaf tonic have been tried by 11000 plus families to bring a relief in their condition ranging from bloating to hyperacidity to diabetes so today he is going to share us a wonderful insight on topic to eat or not to eat and how fasting affects our digestion so we have tried fasting and we have believed that there are the so many myths and uh, misconception behind it so today we are going to get all this answered clear so whatever you have questions related to this topic you can raise them under the q and a section or under the chat box so harsh will take it one on one and will give you the very good insight of it so stay tuned with us and please join me to give a very warm welcome to harsh uh harsh this floor is yours now you can share the insightful sessions today thank you thank you so much ekta just before i start quickly can everybody hear me clearly and if you can just give me a quick yes in the chat box so that i know that i'm completely audible and there's no issue all right superb superb well nice to see everybody and i'm glad that you've taken time out today to listen to what i have to share let me give you just a little bit of background as to who i am and where my research and knowledge comes from so that you get more context for today's session so we've been studying the gut health space for 7 years normally when we say gut health in this country the number one thing that comes to mind is constipation pet saaf fiber isab gul but the type of gut health problems that we have today are very different kuch bhi khate hai kabhi kabhi bloating ho jata hai even when you are eating home cooked food sometimes we have acidity even if you are eating good healthy food right you are eating roti sabji cooked in less oil there seems to be no concern still suddenly you have loose motions or you have to go to the bathroom multiple times a day so the study of digestion is very very deep and there are a lot of aspects that we need to uncover in terms of not just what we eat but also what we don't eat the reason for having today's session especially on fasting is because i think it is the easiest way somebody can start to understand their own digestion agar aapko janna hai ki aapki body mein kaun sa khana achhi tarike se pachega aur jo nahi pachega kya khana suit karega kya nahi karega what food will suit you and what will not suit you the number one place to start is to just understand how your digestion and digestive system actually works if you start from this point agar aap yahan se chalu karoge then no matter what any online health influencer will say you will know exactly what will work for you and what will not kahan aapko invest karna chahiye health ke liye aur kahan invest karne se koi fayda nahi hoga so that's the aim and the point of today's session towards the end of what i'll do of course i'll, I'll leave it open to questions so we can answer you know i'll take them one on one but i'm just going to start with some absolute basics i'm sharing my screen quickly i'm starting first with what happens when you eat some food bahut basic hai but a lot of people don't know exactly where food goes and how long it takes so simply main aapko pehle samjhane wala hu ki jab aap koi bhi cheez khate ho kitne ghante mein wo kahan jata hai aur kya karta hai usko uska hota kya hai so usually for the first 2 hours let me just quickly there you go usually for the first 2 hours of anything that you eat it stays in your stomach this is the first stage or the first step of digestion agar aapne koi heavy khana khaya hai it might stay for 2 to 4 hours if you've had something very light like let's just say fruit juice it will stay for 20 30 minutes so this is very food dependent but normally 2 se 4 ghante ke liye the food will stay in your stomach the moment you are done from that so over the next 6 hours so from you the time you eat and samjho ki apne breakfast 8 baje liya so 9 10 the breakfast is probably in your stomach 11 12 1 up till 2 o'clock the breakfast goes to your small intestine 
वहां इट स्टार्ट गेटिंग ब्रोकन डाउन इन टू स्मॉलर पीसेस जो न्यूट्रिशन आपकी बॉडी को चाहिए इट टेक्स इट अवे एंड द रिमेनिंग फूड दैट इट कैन नॉट प्रोसेस इट विल पुश आउट मतलब आठ बजे का ब्रेकफेस्ट दो बजे तक द थिंग यू हैड एट एट एम इन द मॉर्निंग टिल टू पी एम इट इज इन योर स्मॉल इंडस्टाइन इट्स नॉट लेफ्ट योर बॉडी इट इज स्टिल वेरी मच देर देन फॉर द फॉर द टोटल अमाउंट ऑफ सिक्सटीन टू ट्वेंटी आवर्स विच मीन्स नॉर्मली फॉर द नेक्स्ट ट्वेल्व आवर्स दैट ब्रेकफेस्ट विल गो इन टू योर लार्ज इंटेस्टाइन इट गोज इन टू योर कोलन देर योर गट बैक्टीरिया विल स्टार्ट टू फर्मेंटेड मतलब आपकी बॉडी जो खाना में से निकाल ना पाया वो आपका गट बैक्टीरिया खाएगा दैट्स वॉट योर गट बैक्टीरिया विल स्टार्ट टू फर्मेंट दिस इज वॉट वी नॉर्मली कॉल्ड फाइबर बट द ट्रूथ इज इट्स अ लॉट मोर देन जस्ट फाइबर इट्स ऑल सॉर्ट्स ऑफ थिंग्स दैट योर बॉडी कुड नॉट डाइजेस्ट एंड कुड नॉट ब्रेक डाउन सो जस्ट टू गिव यू परस्पेक्टिव वॉट यू हैड योर ब्रेकफेस्ट एट एट इन द मॉर्निंग टेक्निकली नीड्स टू बी आउट ऑफ योर बॉडी बाय अराउंड थ्री ए एम और फोर ए एम द नेक्स्ट डे that's how long a normal process of digestion takes now if you're non vegetarian it will take longer because some of those proteins are harder to break down and harder to digest it might take 24 25 26 hours if your digestive system is slow it will take longer if your digestive system is fast it will take shorter if you have an infection it will take shorter is come loose motion bolte diarrhea bolte so just step one is when you eat this is what happens we pehla sawal when somebody showed this to me 7 or 8 years ago the first question that i had is are it means ke breakfast bhi khate hai lunch bhi khate hai dinner bhi khate hai so your digestive system is never at rest if you actually calculate everything that is going for a 20 hour cycle it actually means that food is almost always in your digestive system the only place which remains empty from time to time is your stomach which is why after you eat after 2 3 hours this part near your chest starts to feel little bit lighter it doesn't feel as hard or as heavy but the heaviness will start coming near your belly button this is a sign that the food is started going downwards in your system but this isn't the reason why we fast so here what we want to focus most on is understanding what happens when we stop eating now many intentionally yaha cancel kiya i've intentionally cancel the word fast because i think it's quite extreme and when you start learning more about what i'm about to say you will understand ki hum jab nahi khate uska ye matlab nahi hai ki hum fasting kar rahe there is a big difference between the two i'm going to explain exactly what that is so again let's start by understanding subah aapne breakfast khaya now assume ki 10 baj gaye you had breakfast at 8 o'clock assume it is 10 o'clock right what is happening in your body for the first time your stomach is now empty there is nothing happening inside your stomach you will feel light at least you should feel light but normally anything which is inside the stomach that is stuck to the walls that has not been digested properly that has not become liquid enough to move into the rest of the system it starts to get cleaned this is like an automatic system by the body you don't have to do anything you don't have to work out you don't have to do any asanas no yoga body ek khud ba khud karti hai it is how the body naturally works in its system in its way of operating when you don't eat for four more hours after that usually you will start noticing that your small intestine will also clear up now when your small intestine clears up something quite interesting happens the body moves again into its program that it calls the motor migrating complex mmc it means that anything that is stuck to the walls of the small intestine the body starts sending waves it starts on the stomach and goes all the way to your large intestine ye kuch bhi khana baki raha kuch bhi kacha raha kuch bhi pipe mein atak gaya hai sab kuch niklega and it will automatically come into your large intestine i'll tell you a small secret if you look at an endoscopy report or even if you look at a colonoscopy report you will notice ke small intestine completely clean lagta hai it is pink it is there's like there's no food there ever sab kachra aapko large intestine mein hi milta hai and this is the beauty of the body the body's own mechanism is such that it activates this mmc and send waves to clean the small intestine wo bhi khane ke 4 ghante ke baad just 4 hours after you completed your meal but there is a few there's a small catch and you have to understand this really well agar aapne wapas kuch bhi aapke mouth mein dala if you had anything else even a small bite 
this process will completely stop. You will have no cleaning effect. See, the body can do one of two things, right? Either it will clean the system or it will digest your food. So if you're eating, it gives food priority. And if you're not eating, it will give cleaning priority. So let's just take a quick step back and we'll just summarize first. Aapne khana khaya, do se char ghande peet mein, char se chhe ghande aapke small intestine mein, aur kuch bara ghande ke aas paas rega almost aapke large intestine mein. Kul mila ke kuch sola se bees ghande hoote hai. Agar aapne nahi khaya, the moment you've had your last meal, six hours later, your stomach and your small intestine will be completely clean. Agar aapne ek badam bhi beech mein khaya, ek chai ka kap bhi piya, if you've had anything, these processes will not happen. Aapka stomach clean hona band ho jayega. It will stay as it was before because your body is busy digesting food. Now, before I explain the implications, before I explain ke exactly kya ho hai, I'll show you some nuances as well. Are you with me? Agar aap mere saath ho, if you have understood so far, just again, drop a quick yes in the chat box. Just let me know so that I can continue. Otherwise, I'll go slower and I'll take a recap of what's happening. All right, super. Super. I love the participation. Keep it going. Absolutely wonderful. Okay, I'll do, I'll do a small recap as well so that it becomes quite clear. You've had food. Do gande ke liye stomach mein. Chhe gande ke liye small intestine mein. Or kuch das se bara gande large intestine mein. Matlab khana khaya, wo sharir se nikle ga. It will leave the body 20 hours later. But agar aapne khana khaya, uske baad kuch nahi khaya. Chhe gande mein. Aapka stomach or small intestine bilkul saaf ho jayega. It automatically become clean. But there are a few things that will interrupt this. Agar aapka haat kehen bhi, beech mein aapne dal ya koi bhi snack mein, this process will get stopped. Aap yakin nahi karo ki, agar aapne gum chabaya, if you start chewing gum, aap khaa nahi rahe ho, sif chew kar rahe ho. Tabhi bhi the signal that goes to the body is that food is coming. And both these processes will get stopped again. Another very interesting thing, even if you smell the food, agar aapne, you know, it's not a question completely of, of eating. Even if you smell the food, your digestion again starts to get activated. And again, this process of cleaning will not happen as effectively as it was if you were away from food. Isle, kaam office mein karna chahiye, not in your cafeteria or your kitchen. Because it does not help the cleaning process happen normally. Uh, uh, Harsh, I'm sorry, sorry to uh, stop you here. Yeah. A couple of people are saying that they don't understand Hindi. Ah, so okay. if you can use the English medium. I'll, I'll, stay, I'll, stay, I'll stay with English. Please so go ahead. You, so if you, I'll just quickly recap. So if you stop eating food, this is the process that should happen. But if you're sitting in a place where the smell of food is still coming, if you're sitting in a place like your canteen or your cafeteria, or even if you're sitting in your office with a box of snacks open next to you, this process will not happen normally. Your body will not be clean. Your system will not work as efficiently as it should. But the system, like I said, we're not finished. We've only reached the small intestine yet. I think the magic really happens in the large intestine. So at this point, imagine that you have fasted for 16 hours. You've had breakfast. You've skipped lunch. You've skipped dinner as well. So you've not had lunch, you've not had dinner, and it's around 8 or 9 o'clock at night. At this point, all the food that you've had, your entire breakfast, is now sitting in your large intestine, in your colon. You are not eating it, but your gut bacteria is eating it. They are eating the food and they are fermenting it. They're creating all types of different compounds that your body will then absorb. So although you have not actually had anything, you've not eaten anything for the last 12 hours, still your body is getting nutrition from somewhere, from your gut bacteria. This is why even after 12 hours, it is not correct to say that you have been fasting. I think fasting is a completely different state. Fasting is when there is no food in your body. Even after 12 hours, there is food in your large intestine. That is why you have not eaten you, we cannot say that you have fasted. We can only say that you have not eaten the food after your breakfast. This is where it starts to get very interesting. What happens when that food gets pushed out of the large intestine? So now there is no food in your body. Your stomach is clear. Your small intestine is clear. And your large intestine is largely clear. It will never be 100% clear, but it is largely clear. 
I think there are many applications and meaning of this. So the first thing is you have to understand your gut bacteria. If I break down gut bacteria into two types, and there are multiple types, but these are just two categories. One is the type of gut bacteria that eats the food you eat, which means when you eat, your gut bacteria feeds on that. And when it feeds on that, it survives. When you stop eating, that gut bacteria has no food to eat. It begins to starve. And when it starves, it automatically starts to die. You might be confused. Gut health, gut bacteria, all of this should be positive, right? Fasting is supposed to be good for us. But make no mistake, when you stop eating food, there is one segment of gut bacteria which will die because it is dependent on your food, on what you eat to survive. But there is another category of gut bacteria. We typically call them mucin eaters, M-U-C-I-N. Mucin is something that your body produces from inside. And there's a very large category of gut bacteria that only eats this mucin. So what naturally happens is that when you've not eaten food, your gut bacteria that, that rely on that food will start to diminish. They'll start to die. But the gut bacteria that is eating your mucin will start to flourish. It will start to grow. So in many ways, you have completely changed your own internal gut bacteria makeup. Now, whether this is good or bad, we'll address that in a second. But fasting or even not eating for 12 or 13 hours is exactly like taking a probiotic tablet. You can quote me on this because it makes a very large difference to your gut microbiome. It will completely change the makeup of what it is that is inside your gut bacteria and your gut microbiome structure. Now, this change, is it good or is it bad? Till date, we don't know. No researcher has been able to prove whether this is a very good thing or a very bad thing. We only know that some strains of bacteria are very good for you. They're associated with good changes. Helps you lose weight, helps to manage blood sugar, helps to manage blood pressure, helps to increase sharpness of the mind. That strain of bacteria grows a lot more when you start to fast because that bacteria is a mucin eater. But a lot of, and a lot of bacteria which are negative bacteria harmful fungus, parasites, worms, all of those depend on food you eat. So when you stop eating it, a lot of the bad stuff starts to go away. But make no mistake, some of the good stuff will also go away. That is why fasting and the effect that it has on your gut bacteria is currently being studied. There is no definitive answer, but it's important to understand this is happening. Now, in my mind, fasting doesn't even start here. Fasting really starts after this point because now we come to other aspects. What happens 20 to 24 hours later? So assume you've had breakfast at 8 in the morning. You've not had anything throughout the whole day. The entire day you've not had anything. Next day in the morning at 8 o'clock, here's what's happening. You'll start, the impact will start to come across different body functions, not just your digestive system. I'm going to talk about some of those functions. But before I do, let's take a quick step back. Understand that when we eat, we get energy from the food. When we don't eat, your body needs to take energy from somewhere. Otherwise, how will every you know, muscle, every cell, everything perform its function properly? In fact, the act of digestion alone takes 10% of your calories, which means if you eat 1500 calories in a day, your digestive system itself needs some 150 to 200 calories to use and burn and process all that food. So where is all the energy coming from? Your body is not designed to fail when food doesn't come in. Your body is extremely intelligent. If you're not eating or when you are eating, anything that is excess, your body stores. And it stores it in multiple places. It stores this in tissue. It stores this in skeletal muscle. It stores this in your liver. And here, the liver is perhaps the biggest area of storage that I'm going to talk about for now. When you don't eat, your liver starts to release its stores. It says, all right, I can see that the system does not have enough energy. Let me give that energy to the system. And so the liver starts to release all the stores of energy that it has kept. Now, this is, of course, quite a dramatic presentation of what may happen. It's not supposed to be like that. But this would just give you an idea 
of what happens when the liver starts to release its stores. You can see that the liver is starting to go from a state where it's slightly fatty or its, its excess is stored to a place where all the excess is starting to get removed. At the 24 hour mark, one day later, your liver will very, very likely exhaust all its stores. It means everything it had stored, all the extra energy that was there, all of that is released and given back into the body. So I'll take a step back. Two hours you didn't eat, stomach became clean. Six hours you didn't eat, small intestine became clean. 20 hours you didn't eat, large intestine became clean and lots of bacteria in our gut have started to change. Some bad ones are going to go away. Some good ones are going to grow. 24 hours and you didn't eat, your liver will probably completely run out of any type of extra store. So the 24-hour mark, of course, there's a lot of genetic variance. For some people, it'll be 20 hours. For some people, it might be 28 hours. But on average, around the 24-hour mark, your body is now completely out of the simplest store of energy, which is it can no longer rely on carbs to keep itself running. It needs another source of energy very, very quickly. Otherwise, your brain will stop functioning. You won't be able to move. You'll feel tired. But still, Jains, Muslims, a lot of people do fasting for 30-30 days. If this is true, how come they're surviving? It's because the body moves into a completely different state. It does something that we call as a metabolic switch. As, I'm, as you can see on the chart over here, as your glucose levels start to come down, as your body is using all the sugar it has, the body reverses and starts creating something called ketones. A ketone is basically, a, well, it's a type of acid really. What you're doing is you're taking fatty acids, which is fats, and you're converting it into ketone, which is a, a type of molecule that can give you energy as well. It can go into your brain, it can go into your tissues, and it can keep your cells powered on. Ketone is like, it's a sort of backup energy. It's not something that you should be relying 100% on. It's a fail-safe. If you don't get glucose, your body can survive on ketones. It was a survival mechanism that we all have innately within us. Now, as your glucose is coming down and your ketone is going up, there is a point where the whole thing switches. Your body is now running on ketones. It's no longer running on glucose. This switch is what we call a metabolic switch. And this switch is associated with lots of benefits. People say that this switch causes insulin sensitivity. This switch reduces the amount of insulin your body needs. This switch, for example, will start improving the amount of blood sugar that is, uh, that is currently in, so your sugar that is in your blood, so your glycemic control starts to become better. This switch has an effect on blood pressure. This switch has an effect, for example, on cholesterol, on HDL, on LDL, because the fats which are coming to create ketones where are they coming from? It's not your actual fat. It's all types of fat, including things like esters, like cholesterol, you know, LDL, etc. So this switch allows the body to start moving into a completely different type of state. But it doesn't end here. Even after you have ketones, your energy production in the body is not sufficient. See, like I said, this is plan B. This is not plan A. Plan A was eat. You have energy, you can do all your activities. But when you don't eat and you've gone for more than 24 hours, your body starts making ketones. But how much energy your body needs and how much the ketones can provide is not always the same. Maybe your energy needs are this much, but the ketones are providing this much. How do you fill the gap? The body starts getting a little bit desperate. And when I say it gets desperate, it starts searching pretty aggressively for things that it can use as energy. And this is where, you know, once you've crossed that 24 hour, 36 point mark, this is where the desperation begins. One of the acts of desperation is the body starts discarding everything it does not need. It's like if you've run out of money, but you have to pay rent, you'll start selling any furniture that you can to put the money together. In the same way, if your cells have a lot of old components that are not being used, that were not discarded properly, the cells start to degrade that, consume that as a form of energy. Now, one way of looking at it is, is you're cleaning everything, right? Your body is becoming 
richer in terms of new active components. Another way of looking at it is the active things are eating away everything that is not required. So this combination is such that your body at this point is working at its extremes. It's working closer to the top of its limit. This process is what we call autophagy. This cleaning internal process, especially from an intracellular and slightly extracellular standpoint. Autophagy is very interesting. The person who discovered this won the Nobel Prize quite a few years ago. But autophagy is linked to, again, multiple benefits. Still not fully proven, but there's a lot of reason to believe that autophagy, again, will give you health benefits. What happens if you cross this 36-hour mark? What happens then? See, the body, like I said, is already operating in a state of extremes. It is now in a state of stress. Fasting is a type of stress. It's stress for the body. Like exercise is a type of stress. It's stress for the body. A little bit of stress is good. It makes you alert. It makes you sharp. It makes you remove everything you don't need. It makes you use the stores you have. It cleans out dirty gut bacteria. It makes sure your system is clean. But excess stress can start to create real, real nuisance. In fact, let me share something quite specific with you. I'm not sure if you can still see this um, in terms of my screen. I have a sister, a uh, cousin sister actually, who's doing a 30-day fast. So I'm Jen, Gujarati. And one of my sisters is currently doing a 30-day fast. She didn't ask me before she did it. She just decided to do it as part of her own beliefs. I want to explain exactly the challenges that happen when, you're when you put your body through something so extreme for 30 days. So here's a paper that you can see which says the effect of gen fasting on different biochemical parameters. I'm sort of quickly moving into the, into the place where you will see what's happening pre-fasting and what's happening post-fasting. As you can imagine, look at BMI, maybe an indication of weight. You can see that you know the weight has come down. It was 27 before, it has now become 26. That's good. It's positive. Everybody wants to look thinner, younger, slimmer. Great, wonderful. You can see that pulse rate has gone up. You can see, for example, that hemoglobin has stayed largely the same. But now here are the problems. Look what's happening. Her blood sugar, or for that matter, these people's blood sugar has gone up. It used to be 100 before she fasted. It is 130 after she has fasted. That's confusing, right? Blood sugar should have gone down. But this is what happens when your body hits a state of extreme stress. It starts doing things out of complete desperation because right now survival is the only thing that matters. It's not just blood glucose, for example, that's going up. Let me show you a couple of other numbers. Your triglycerides have started to go up. Your HDL, which is what we typically call as good cholesterol, but we can discuss that separately. It's coming down. You can see cortisol, which is the number one indicator of stress. It used to be 13. It has now gone to 17. So like I said, make no mistake, fasting is a type of stress. And if you do it for extended periods of time in a non-medically supervised manner, it will cause tremendous, tremendous trouble with your health. There's no doubt about this. So before I move forward to the last segment of what I want to share today, let's quickly do a recap. Point one, which is perhaps extremely important, is that fasting doesn't begin when you stop eating. Fasting begins when food has left your body. This is a big distinction. Fasting doesn't begin when you stop eating. Fasting begins when food has left your body. This doesn't mean that everybody needs to fast. The benefits will start when you've stopped eating. But the full benefits of fasting, the way we have so far researched it and the way the world talks about it, that it's this magical miracle thing, it can only begin when the food has left your body. Which means if you're doing it for 12 hours, 14 hours, 16 hours a day, it is very, very unlikely that you're going to see the full benefits accrue of fasting. However, you will. there are multiple reasons for you to keep gaps between your food Make sure that you eat, you know, 12 hours later, especially your dinner and your breakfast, because this will definitely help to keep your digestive system a little bit at rest, at least more than it is today. This is, like I said, part number one, right? Real fasting starts when food is leaving your system. 
The second thing is fasting is a form of stress. You need to understand this. Stress is not bad. A little bit of stress is good. It helps. But if you extend that stress on your body, it can create all types of dysfunction, especially if you're not prepared for it or if you're not doing it under the guidance of a medical practitioner. So if you're doing any type of extended fast, which in my mind is more than 36 hours or maybe even 48 hours, you definitely need to do it under the guidance of a medical practitioner. Do not attempt this on your own, especially if it is your first time. You can create tremendous imbalance in your body, which can start becoming a nuisance in terms of what needs to happen. Uh, moving to the last stage, where it's, I think, in my opinion, it's the part that people don't talk about at all. What do you eat before a fast? And what are you supposed to eat after a fast? If you understand this, I guarantee you, you will understand gut health better than most people. I'll say this again, right? What are you supposed to eat before a fast? And how are you supposed to break a fast? What are you supposed to eat after a fast? So before I go forward, I want to actually hear this from you, right? How are you supposed to break a fast? If I gave you three options, carbs, proteins, and fats, what would you say is the correct answer in terms of breaking a fast? Just put your answer into the chat box. Let's take a look at what everybody wants. Right? I see carbs. A lot of people are saying all of them. Okay. Very few people are saying proteins. Keep going. Keep going. I'm going to wait for a few minutes. Let's sort of at least a few seconds. Let's get some more answers in. A little bit of participation will be very, very good. Chocolate. That's a great answer. That's fascinating. Uh, carbs. So when you eat, any type of carb, just after you've broken a fast, your body does not try to use it immediately. The body will try to store it very, very quickly. So this is the number one problem that we typically have with breakfast as well. So breakfast is actually break fast, right? That's the concept. You fasted overnight. But what's the first thing you're going to put into your body? Today we have cereals, milk, you know, that's the sort of stuff that we, ragi, upma, these are the sort of things you put into the body. These are all carb-heavy items. And when you eat something carb-heavy, after you fast, even for 12, 13 hours, the first thing your body does, it tries to store it. It will start moving it directly to the liver. That is why a lot of people are linking carb-heavy meals when you break a fast to fatty liver. Because your body starts to store it. It's aggressively storing it because it's beginning to worry that it might not get this type of food source again later on. Now, the answer is not protein either because protein is very difficult to digest. When you've not consumed anything for almost 24 hours, your stomach and your gastric system in particular does not activate immediately like it's supposed to. I'll take a moment to explain how that works as well in a second. It takes time and protein requires a lot of stomach acid to break down. It's not easy to break down. So going straight after protein is also not going to be easy for you to do. The answer is definitely not fats. It's the correct answer is supposed to be a very digestible form of protein. So in protein also there are grains. For example, if you're eating dal, we know that most types of yellow dal, like tuvir dal, for example, are very hard to digest. It takes a lot of time in your stomach. You eat too much, you'll feel heavy and bloated. But mung dal is not like that. Mung dal is a very easy to digest protein. If you sprout the mung, it's even easier to digest. If you drink just mung water, it's even easier to digest. So believe it or not, if you go back to scriptures of most ancient cultures, when they break fasts, and this is across the world, it's in Africa, it's in Europe, it's in, in Islamic countries, it's in India, of course, it doesn't matter where you are. Most people will break a fast with some type of easily digestible protein. And usually, it's some type of liquid. Sometimes, they'll supplement that with something which is some type of sugar water. So like a, you know, something that you don't have to process, you don't have to digest. Sugar directly goes into your bloodstream. It's not recommended, but of course, you're not drinking large amounts of sugar water. You're having a small cup or a small amount just so that your body starts to feel energetic one more. So the answer, the correct answer, supposed to be a lightly or easy to digest protein 
And ideally, you want to have it with some type of herbs, some type of digestives, jeera, uh, adrak, anything that allows just get the system going one more time, which will allow your digestive system to restart slowly because it's basically been shut. It's been at rest for quite some time. Now, I want to take a step back and I just want to quickly explain how your stomach actually works. So I think it's extremely fascinating. I've already told you that the first phase of digestion, the first stage is your stomach. But perhaps the more important and interesting part is that how you activate your stomach acid. The first aspect of this is smell. In medical terms, we call this the cephalic phase of digestion. When you smell food, your stomach suddenly starts secreting more acid. It's like the digestive system is saying, all right, give me food. I'm expecting food. Let me start processing it. So that's smell. The second one, which is very interesting, is actually your mind. Now, specifically, the clock in your mind. If you eat lunch at 1 o'clock every single day, notice suddenly at 12.40, even if you don't know the time, you'll start feeling hungry. The reason is because your body works on its own type of clock. It's called the circadian rhythm. And your circadian rhythm will determine exactly when you feel hungry. Which is why if you suddenly eat lunch today at 1 o'clock, at tomorrow at 3 o'clock, the same food, you'll feel heavier when you eat it at 3. Because your stomach was not ready to digest that food. It wasn't expecting it then. It was expecting it two hours before. And there are ways to retrain your circadian clock. But you have to do that one-on-one. -on -one. It's not possible to suddenly do it you know, overnight and expect that it will suddenly work. This is also, by the way, that why there is a difference between being hungry and fasting. A lot of us, I've been guilty of this myself as well. If we're working very hard in the morning, sometimes we skip lunch. Now, technically, if you skip lunch, it should be a good thing, right? You should not feel acidic. You should not have a problem, right? Fasting is supposed to clean the system. How come people who skip meals get acidity problems? Why do they get heartburn? Why do some of them suddenly feel like vomiting? What is the reason behind this? And the answer is, again, like I said, a lot of fasting has to do with the mind. We've seen this time and time again. We deal with almost five and a half thousand patients a month, all only with gut health. So we see this in almost 200 to 250 patients every month. When people are eating certain types of food, their body is normal. When they stop eating, the problem suddenly aggravates. And it's because they have not decided that they want to fast. They have just subtly skipped a meal. When you decide you don't want to fast, you don't spend time around food. You spend time away from it. You're not even activating the cephalic phase of digestion. Your circadian rhythm wise also, it doesn't get activated as strongly because mentally you know that today I'm not going to be eating. But on a day where you've not told yourself that and you start moving around food, but you're skipping the meal because you're too tired or there's too much work or you're under a lot of stress, your body reacts differently. You're hungry, you're not fasting. So there is a huge difference between the two. That is why even when you fast and you're doing it for the first time, don't start with 24 hours at one stretch. Whatever you used to do before, do one hour extra. So let's say you're eating your last meal, your dinner today at 9.30, for example, at night. And you're eating breakfast, let's say at 8 o'clock in the morning. Push one of them either forward or backward. Make your dinner 8.30 and leave your breakfast constant. Then make your dinner 7.30 and leave your breakfast constant. This allows your circadian rhythm to set itself so that later on you'll be prepared to do a longer fast at one. I hope this gives you a little bit of perspective in terms of you know, what we're trying to share when it comes to fasting and not fasting. So I'm just going to be leaving this on the screen as the final three takeaways for this particular session, which is to eat or not to eat. The answer is, you need a little bit of both. My current routine, for five days of the week, I'll eat normally. I'll have my three meals a day. But I do a 36-hour fast, which normally is on one day of the week. My last meal of the day will be at 6 p.m. And my next meal of the day is usually at 6 or 7 a.m. the day after. I try to do this once a week just so that I can keep my body in that state where I'm not operating with excess where I'm operating, you know, at the correct homeostatic balance of where I want to be. So this just gives you a little bit of perspective as to what fasting is, how, you know, food affects your body, where food goes, and perhaps more importantly, what happens when you don't actually eat. 
I'm more than happy to take questions, but first, just quickly over to Ekta uh, to do the final roundup of the session. Yeah, so thank you, Harsh, for a, such a wonderful insights that you have shared on fasting. So uh, we will quickly launch a poll. And so poll is live now. So you can just uh, give us the feedback on how was the session and what kind of another kind of sessions that you would like to have it in the next couple of weeks and months. So the poll is live, you can uh, rate this session. And meanwhile, we will start with an Q&A session. If anybody wants uh, from the audience, you want uh, to speak directly with uh, Harsh regarding your questions, you can raise your hand so that we can move it to your panelist and you can ask your question directly there are a couple of questions in q &A. Yeah. you can take them up yeah 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 so there are questions under q a as well and there are uh, in the chat as well so we can cater one by one harsh sure all right so i think the number one question i see is water intake water is a zero calorie liquid even tea has something that can start and activate your digestion water doesn't Water spends less than five minutes in your stomach. It hardly spends 20 minutes in your small intestine. So no, water does not break fasting in any way. So you can have water throughout the entire day as you fast. In fact, I recommend it because staying hydrated is quite important. So water is definitely not something that you should be worried about when you're fasting. Uh, I see, in fact, I think six or seven questions are there. There are two questions around diabetics and fasting. Look, if you go to the most expensive diabetic uh, educators today, right? you pay 5,000, 10,000 rupees a session as well. The default is that they're going to ask you to fast in some way, shape or form. They very likely will, un unless you have a pre-existing condition. Now, this is dependent and based because they're all trying to reduce the fat around your liver and the fat inside your pancreas. One we call, well, NA or alcoholic fatty liver, and the other one is what we call is the fatty pancreas. To remove the fat from inside these organs, fasting is the easiest, smartest, and most simply safe way to get that done. But fasting is not recommended for diabetics generally. We work with quite a few diabetic patients too, where we put continuous glucose monitors on them. If you look at their patterns, if they start fasting, the blood sugar does not come down. The blood sugar starts to go up first. This is a temporary phenomenon. So if you fast for the first few days and you check your fasting blood sugar, you'll start worrying, oh, it's going up. You'll freak out as a diabetic. The reason it's going up is because it's a signal for your liver to start pushing out excess. And your liver is pumping it all out at one go. So if you are fasting as a diabetic, again, do it under medical supervision. Do not just do it blindly because of two reasons. One, you may see the results and you might feel disheartened because you don't know how long you have to keep doing it to see a good result. And two, if your current medication is something that's going to intervene with the fasting protocol, then it might create nuisance as well. So if you're fasting as a diabetic, you should consider it, by the way, very much as a diabetic, but do it under medical supervision. Don't just attempt it alone. It's not the right way of doing it. Uh, I see, how about green tea or black coffee? A lot of people online will tell you that green tea and black coffee will not affect fasting. I completely disagree. You have to understand everybody is indexing only on two things. It, the green tea has no carbs or black coffee has no carbs. If it's got no carbs, it will not start digestion. That is not correct. Green tea and black coffee have a lot of other things. They've got tannins, they've got polyphenols, they've got all types of antioxidants. Where do you think all that is going? It's not like those suddenly come into the body and go into your body. They need to be broken down. They need to be biotransformed. They need to be converted chemically into a format in which the body can use them. So green tea and black coffee very much activates your digestive system. It's not just that because they've got no nutrition or no calories, nothing will happen. It definitely activates the digestive system. And that is why I would not recommend taking green tea. Water, by the way, does not have this feature. Water does not have random polyphenols inside it. If it's purified water, it will just have a couple of minerals and those do not affect your, uh, your digestion speed or your digestive capacity. 
I'm seeing all right quite a few uh, food items here. So there's another interesting one. Can we eat fruits or cucumber during fasting? Look, it depends entirely on what your objective is. What I presented to you today is the most extreme form of fasting, 36 hours water only. But make no mistake, anything less than that is also net good for your body. It just may not be as good. If you're eating six times a day today, your small intestine is not going to be clean. I guarantee you, no matter what you do, you eat six or seven times a day today, your whole body is going to feel heavy, dirty, bloated. However, if you start keeping a gap of let's even four hours between breakfast, lunch and dinner, suddenly you will start seeing benefits. Now, if you increase that gap to six hours, you'll see more benefits. Ten hours, you'll see even more benefits. So wherever you start from, there is no wrong point. I'm just presenting an extreme picture for you. Now, let me answer the question you've asked. Fruits ka sakte ke nahi, right? Can we eat fruits during fasting? It's a different type of fasting. When you eat, or rather, more specifically, when you drink certain types of vegetable juices, not fruit juices, vegetable juices. What is the difference? They don't have as much sugar. When you drink vegetable juices, your body gets the nutrition it needs. So it doesn't go to a system or a state of stress. Some food is coming into the body. But your digestive system is not that activated because it doesn't have to break down foods. The blender or the mixie has already broken it down. You just have to digest it. You just have to absorb it. So in the same way, when you're drinking, let's say, vegetable juices throughout the day, four or five glasses, yes, in a form, it is breaking fasting. But it is still better than eating full whole meals, especially if you're thinking about sort of cleaning your body and bringing things back to normal from one's perspective. So like I said, don't think in extremes from day one that you need to do a water-only fast through and through. Absolutely not. A vegetable juice cleanse for three, four days or even a single day is also going to be positive because you will feel the difference later. But again, keep in mind, and, I, and if you're going to try this, you have to see this once. What you eat the first solid meal that you will eat after your juice cleanse will either make you feel very heavy or very light. And if you try something with a lot of carbs, you'll feel very heavy. But if you try small portions of easily digestible food, you'll feel very light and your system will start to feel normal again. Right? So train your system to do these things. All right. Uh, I see a couple of... So another question I'm seeing is, will there be issues if we skip breakfast and take lunch every day? No. If your body is used to it, there, there will be no issue. I'll give you again a simple example. Imagine you study Spanish every day. After a lot of time, you'll start becoming fluent in the subject. Imagine you go to the gym and you pick up the same 5 kg dumbbell every single day. After a point, the 5 kg dumbbell will add no extra weight to your hands. You'll feel very easy picking it up. In the same way, if you skip breakfast all the time, your body will mentally be prepared not to have breakfast. Meaning your body is now accustomed to that routine and schedule. So whether you skip breakfast in the morning or you skip dinner at night, fasting is fasting. However, more so now, people are talking about something called circadian fasting. Said differently, and again, it depends on which school of thought you believe, we're supposed to eat in line with the sun. So, because the sun directly affects our digestive capacity. Now, what I'm saying, there will never be any scientific research behind this because it's very difficult to prove. This is what most Indian yogis believe. This is what Ayurveda has built on as well. The idea that the biggest meal of the day is supposed to be when the sun is at its peak, lunchtime. That's why you're not supposed to skip lunch. It's the most, it's a food you'll digest the best. And the meal of the day you should be have to break the fast is your breakfast in the morning. When the sun starts to go down, you're supposed to have a lighter meal, a dinner, because the digestive system slows down at night. So when you're eating heavy at night, it will take longer to get digested and it will create nuisance. So personally, I prefer the format where you're eating a lighter dinner or skipping dinner, not where you're skipping breakfast. But to answer the question, no, it's not a problem if you skip breakfast every single day. That's entirely fine. Uh, can you suggest food plans if fasting doesn't happen? That's a completely separate subject. You need to work with a dietitian because what your body needs is what the food plan should say. If you are you know, deficient, for example, in B12 and omega-3, that's what your food plan should have. It's not possible to create an alternative just because we're not, we're not fasting, for example. How to fast for... for Fat loss. Okay. 
um, you can't control that. There's no way you can control that. For some people, if they're exercising while they're fasting, so let's say I didn't eat, you know, a dinner last night. My dinner was, let's say, at 6 p.m. last night. And this morning at 6 a.m., I've gone to the gym. So after 12 hours, I've gone to the gym. Naturally, all the sugar in my body will be used faster because I've gone to the gym. So my body will start looking for extra sugar much quicker and it might contribute to fat loss. Now, this is what theory says, but it doesn't always apply in reality. What your resting metabolism is, how much food you had the night before, what state your body is in, how frequently you go to the gym, what are the size and capacity of your muscles, all these things affect whether you're going to lose weight or not lose weight with fasting. Net, net, when you start even doing simple fasting, let's say you skip one meal, the best case, you reduce the amount of calories you eat in a day. And you create a small deficit and you'll start losing weight automatically. So there is no correct amount of time to perfect the fasting regimen for you. You just have to try, see what works and keep measuring on the weighing scale. At best, sorry, at worst, you'll be in a caloric deficit and you'll start to lose weight. And at best, you might get multiple other metabolic advantages that will work for you. Um, so again, I'm seeing a lot of questions. I have a gastritis problem. Can I fast? I don't recommend it at all. Uh, I think when you have any type of stomach irritation, your body is already in a slightly compromised gastrointestinal state. You should not be thinking of fasting. By the way, if you have gastritis, one of the things that I think you should consider doing is getting an H. pylori test. Uh, identifying that, eliminating that from your system will help you get rid of the gastritis much, much faster. It's something that we work on at my company. How about intermittent fasting? Uh, I'm following it for an entire month. Like I said, Yogeshwarji, it doesn't matter what type of fasting you're doing. If you're following something that's working for you, continue it. The longer the period where you don't eat food, the longer the benefits that accrue. So if something is already working for you, you don't need to change it, but keep experimenting with it to see what works better, right? This time when you're fasting, make sure your dinner is of a different type. Eat maybe a lighter dinner and see that it gets out of the body faster. Eat a dinner that's richer in fiber. See what happens you know, on the day of fasting. When you break the fast, once break it with light meal, maybe something like dahi rice and see how it's affecting your body. Once break it with a protein heavy, a protein rich meal, like something like moong dal water and see how it's you know, affecting your body. So keep experimenting at the ends and you'll suddenly find that one zone where you feel extremely light, extremely energetic, and very vivacious. So that's the zone that you want to find for yourself. Uh, another one that I see right now is sometimes in the day, I feel cravings for the full day. How do you solve it? Food cravings are not always linked to what your body wants. Think about it. Why do we get a craving? This is perhaps a really is a very important question to answer as well. And I'll tell you because it's something we work on at Hug. Why do you get a craving? Is it because your food, your body wants something that it hasn't gotten? And does your body need energy? Does your body, what does your body need? Why are you getting the craving? So the answer is not always that. If you eat a bag of chips, you eat some lay, some Pringles, maybe even if you have some Doritos, your, your body will always want more of that. That craving is because of taste. You want to put something in there. The second type of craving that you normally get is because of your mind. You're stressed, you're bored, you want a distraction. So that, that craving is not physiological. It's not coming from inside your body. The third type of craving that comes from inside your body is actually an infection. You have a fungal overgrowth or a bacteria overgrowth. And it's not you that's craving the food. It's your fungus or your bacteria. This, by the way, is very, very, very common. In my opinion, almost 50% or 40% of all cases of extreme cravings have a fungal overgrowth problem. Specifically, they have a type of fungus called candida. If you eliminate the fungus, the craving magically goes away. It's really astonishing. It's quite easy to eliminate the fungus too. But you need to work one-on-one -on -one with someone for that. So if you're feeling cravings the whole day, the answer is not to fast. Because that's not going to address the matter entirely. The answer is to figure out where the craving is coming from. Is it taste? Is it distraction? Is it an infection? And if it's neither of these three, it could be a nutrient deficiency. 
maybe your body is saying, hey, I really need some iron or I really need some vitamins and you're not giving it to me. So please find some food that, you know, that you, so I can get that in the body. If it's a nutrient deficiency, you need to fix the nutrient deficiency and the cravings will begin to go. Away. So cravings and fastings don't have any direct connection. But if you find out the root cause of your cravings, the cravings will suddenly start to go away. All right, quite interesting. I'm going to share quickly um, just a link in the chat box. Like I said, I've spent a lot of time understanding how different foods affect Indian bodies in particular. How, for example, eating honey affects our stomach. How paneer affects the large intestine. How to identify if you have infections in your gut or not. Are, are you in a state of hormonal imbalance and is that causing your constipation? Why do you suddenly get headaches? Why does your skin become itchy? All of these things are linked in many, many ways to your gut. Not always, but more than 90% of the time. I spent a lot of time figuring out what those connections are, especially for an Indian audience. And I share a lot of that on my newsletter. I'm putting a link out there in the chat box just now so you get an idea of what that looks like. For everybody that signs up right now with just your email address, I'm going to be sending you something called the fermentation tables. It's a list of food arranged in order of bloating. This is something that we've done extensive research on. What foods in what quantities normally cause excessive bloating for an Indian audience? So if this is something that you want to try, see, or even print out and keep as a reference as to what food is making you feel unbelievably gassy, Take a look at this list. I'm sharing the link in the chat box. Ikaji, if you can just drop that message uh, publicly, I'll uh, just put in your email address and you'll get that on email. Take some time, go through it. Go through the steps one by one. See the foods you're eating and compare them with the types of foods that you're currently consuming. Maybe you find out what the culprit is. Just removing some of those foods and suddenly you'll start feeling lighter and cleaner in your body. No medicines, no supplements, no doctor visits. You can do this absolutely on your own. All right, super. I think I've answered quite a few, or most of the questions, at least on the Q&A section. If there's anything else that I've missed, by all means. I have a question. Please do. I have a question that, you know, women differ biologically from men. Yeah. And women are basically governed by their cycle and hormonal interplay. Yeah. So does fasting differ for a woman than a man? Very good question. So how does a woman, what are the big aspects in which a woman changes or a woman is different from a man from a digestive system standpoint? Right? Most things are actually fairly the same, but there are two, in my opinion, which are quite different. One is the length of the gastrointestinal system. And the second is the hormonal changes. So let's take each of those one at a time. We'll start with length. On average, and it's actually a very interesting study which shows this. A woman's large intestine is a couple of inches longer than a man's. The reason is, is because it has to sort of curve around the uterus and come. The man doesn't have a uterus. And so because the system is longer, typically if me and my sister, for example, eat the same food, it will usually take her longer to remove it from her body than it does me. This is biologically normal. This is not a problem. It's just the way it is. That is why, by the way, most gastrointestinal, so for gastroenterologists in India, the number one population that comes is female. It's not male. Almost 65% of the patients are actually females and fewer are males, although the problem should be constant in a population which is gender independent. So that's part one, right? That women are usually predisposed to having, uh, or rather the threshold for having gastrointestinal problems is a little bit lower because the system is longer. It usually takes longer for food to pass. There's a higher chance that something goes wrong. It's more sensitive. Point number two, we talk about the hormonal cycle. So when it's your time of the month, and menopause is a separate game, I'm talking about pre-menopause. When it's your time of the month, the key hormone that you release that affects your entire system is called progesterone. Now, progesterone is something which is known to slow the gastrointestinal tract. In fact, so much so that some of the earliest progesterone supplements were sold as anti-diarrheal medication. The people used to consume that just to sort of limit the amount of, you know, the speed at which food was moving through the tract. 
when a woman has an imbalance in the progesterone range, you will normally see that food will either move too quickly or too slow, which is why a lot of women also feel quite heavy as they're, you know, in the, on day one or before day one as the cycle is beginning to progress. Now, how does fasting affect this? The, the link between fasting and hormonal control is still not proven. There is no relationship between the level of hormones you'll have, whether they're in a homeostatic balance and fasting. Because the papers which have come out, the number which say is good and the number which say that bad are equal. So there is no conclusive evidence for this. However, there is one clear benefit that I usually see. Young girls today typically have estrogen excess, right? How does estrogen leave the body? Estrogen is a fat soluble hormone. So the way estrogen leaves the body, it has to break down. It goes through your liver, it comes out in your bile, and then you're supposed to poop it out. You can't pee out estrogen, it's fat soluble. Your pee is urine, it's, it's water. So for the process of elimination to happen, when you fast, your liver is able to eliminate much better. And so one of the things that seems to have more evidence than not is that estrogen levels in particular seem to get balanced much better once you do regular and repeated fasting. But estrogen and the impact on your GI system is not clearly established just yet. What we know for sure is progesterone. And there doesn't seem to be a very strong uh, case that fasting affects progesterone. So the answer is a mixed bag. For women, because the system is longer, they're more predisposed to having you know, digestive trouble. So from that standpoint, fasting should help them more. But then also there's a hormonal component where two key hormones are there. Progesterone affects the GI system a lot more, but fasting doesn't seem to have much of an impact. It seems to have a lot more impact on estrogen in terms of its removal, but that doesn't affect the GI system, right? So there's, there's a wide range of, of what's happening for a woman. If you are a woman and considering fasting, I would very much recommend that you start simple. Don't think that it's any different for you and start to notice the changes in your body step by step. And that should be the easiest way to go forward. Thank think, you. Yeah. yeah. And I maybe think, a woman should be careful towards the end of her cycle because like you mentioned, progesterone. So uh, we know that fasting adds stress to the body. So that yeah. can raise cortisol levels and mess up with the progesterone and end up having, you know, hormonal imbalance during the end days of the cycle. Absolutely correct. Maybe. Absolutely correct. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. This discussion yeah. was insightful. Yeah. I appreciate it. I'm just sharing the link I, because I see a lot of people have actually put their email addresses in the chat box. Um, so for everybody, uh, the link is now actually in the chat box. I'm, I'm just, I've opened it on my screen so you get an idea. Just open the link, put in the email address, hit subscribe and you're good to go. The email that you'll get will have a copy of something called the fermentation tables. So just click on that, download that. It's an Excel sheet. Uh, or actually as a PDF file and either take a printout or just map once. See what you're eating in terms of what can really cause a lot of bloating for you. Keep in mind, bloating is not heaviness. I'm talking about gas. So it can create a lot of gas. And based on what is going to create that gas, try to start making correlations in terms of what you're actually eating, what you can begin to avoid just a little bit. So like, uh, yeah, one of the attendees wants to understand, like, is anemia a good option to clean the larger intestine? If yes, then what should be the frequency? I think satric movement has made this so popular. We get this quite a bit. Uh, your large intestine is multiple feet long. And enema only takes water up to three feet in your large intestine. So number one, will it clean the large intestine? No. It wouldn't because it would only clean a part of it. If you really want to clean the whole intestine, you should do something called colon hydrotherapy, which is much, it's, it's, it's a, you can't do it at home. You have to go to a clinic to get that done. That's part one. Part two, I don't recommend any of this. I mean, I've never, um, I've never done it. I don't think it's required for a lot of people because your body should have the ability to clean on its own. And the food you eat and the type of lifestyle you live will allow that cleaning to happen on its own. You don't need to flush things out with water. So I don't recommend Nima from that perspective. But if it's something that, like I said, works for you, if it's a practice that you believe in, by all means, give it a shot. 
see how you feel right after but please don't try fancy enemas like coffee and you know type probiotic enemas and oil enemas that's not the way to do it you might end up creating more nuisance in your system than otherwise so i don't personally recommend it but if it's something you believe in by all means give it a shot So Harsh, there is one more question in a chat box. Like, suggest some available anti-stress food. That I I don't or know questions like that. There is no fruit that will reduce your stress levels. You will have to reduce your stress levels on your own. Because if there was a fruit item or a vegetable item, everybody would be eating that. Trust me, the sales would go through the roof. No single food item will reduce stress. Stress is something that develops in the mind. It's your perception. You need to change that perception, and the stress goes away. I think we have answered all the questions, <laughs> sure. so we can wrap it up. Please, thank you so much for the time. I really appreciate the opportunity once again, and I hope this was a helpful session for everybody. Uh, yes, I it was indeed. Yes, I think it was. You, you had you really have broken down, you know, broken down the session into fine prints, and I think everybody will have now better understanding of what fasting is actually. and what what it can do to your body and how to choose a fasting based on your body component yep so this was a simple and a uh, straightforward and insightful presentation thank you so much for taking our time and being here with us today so